Good evening. Welcome to the Writers Ooh. Festival and our session on the next Civil War with Stephen Marsh and Adrian Harewood. My name is Sean and I want to begin, as always, by thanking you for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street, and I know wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you some great books. We're broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. We at the festival recognize our obligation as settlers on this land to work to repair the harms perpetrated upon First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous communities and acknowledge the ongoing trauma colonialism continues to inflict. Special thanks to all our donors and to the Ottawa Public Library, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the City of Ottawa, the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, Carleton University, and CBC for their ongoing support throughout the pandemic and beyond. Our host tonight, Adrian Harewood, is a familiar face on CBC and one of many great reasons to study journalism at Carleton University. He's a true friend of the festival and one of this country's most astute readers and thinkers. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to our host this evening, CBC's Adrian Harewood. Well, thanks so much, Sean. Thanks for that very uh, generous introduction. I, I do appreciate it. A time when the very notion of secession in the United States would have been considered heretical, an idea touted by those on the political fringe, those considered to be somewhat unhinged. But in recent years, such talk has become mainstream, part of the United States' national conversation. Indeed, lawmakers like Georgia Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene have openly mused about the prospect of a national divorce and what would come next. Stephen Marsh looks at the prospect of secession, the division of the United States, in his new book, The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future. Stephen is a novelist and culture writer. He's written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The New Yorker. His novels include The Hunger of the Wolf, uh, Raymond and Hannah, and Shining in the Bottom of the Sea. He's also written two books of nonfiction, The Unmade Bed, and How Shakespeare Changed Everything. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really, really happy to be here in Ottawa, virtually at least. Indeed. Stephen, the U.S. Civil War, which pitted forces of the Union or the North against the armed forces of the Confederacy of the South, uh, began on this day, April 12th, oh. 1861, uh, and it ended in May of 1865. We know it lasted four long years. It nearly tore the, the country mm -hmm. to shreds. It was a cataclysmic event. Uh, it caused the death, death of some 600,000 soldiers, uh, 50,000 civilians. Uh, in total, it caused over a million casualties and 3% of the U.S. population at the time. Your, your book starts with this rather stark opening line. The United States is coming to an end. The question is how? How close is the United States to another civil war? Is it inevitable? Oh, nothing's inevitable. I mean, I don't think, um, you know, one of the things when you do projections like this, and this book is basically made up of the best available models on a number of fronts combined, synthesized into a kind of uh, vision of, of the immediate future. You know, nothing nothing is inevitable, but the, the best evidence, um, the, the expert opinion as well as the popular opinion, is that the chances of a U.S. civil war in the next five to ten years is at about 67 percent. So two thirds. And five years ago, it was at 33%. That was the general number for both popular and expert opinion. So um, it's accelerating. Uh, there are certainly very many trends that are pointing towards disunion um, and also many, many trends pointing towards the decline of democracy in the United States, um, as well as, you know, just the, the simple rise of political violence, which we're also seeing, you know, across, across America. So, you know, civil war is not inevitable, but those, those trends are definitely underway and they're incipient. You can see them happening. Talk, talk about those trends. Can you expand on that? Well, you know, the way that I that I thought about this process or the way that the experts that I spoke to thought about it is as a complex cascading system. So that means that lots of different factors are feeding off of each other and that they also they 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 there's a kind of feedback loop where where, you know, bad decisions lead to you know, poor environmental consequences, which then lead to bad outcomes, which then lead to poor political choices. And, and there, you get this kind of feedback in it. Um, you know, the major forces are 
you know, the decline of democracy. So the, the, the simple rot of the political system in the United States and the decline of legitimacy um, in the United States. There's also the fact that America is going to become a majority minority country by 2040, which, you know, traditionally or, you know, in terms, certainly in terms of uh, the study of civil war is all, you know, is a T tends to precede civil war everywhere around the world um, when that when happens. Say majority, um, when, you say, when you say majority minority country, you mean majority non-white country. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like white people right. are 59 percent now. By 2040, they should be under 50 percent. Um, and that's, you know, there's not that has nothing to do with immigration or anything else. That That is just a, uh, a, a demographic trend that's pretty unstoppable. Um, so there's that there's also environmental causes uh even things like increases in heat tend to lead to violence there's uh the, the extreme vulnerability of the uh, of the uh, midwest and the and agricultural product as well as the vulnerability of the eastern seaboard to hurricanes um those things feed into it but uh, but also hyper partisanship and the general rancor of the american system so there's a, it's it's not one thing and all of these things feed into each other and and that's why there's like I, you know I, I tend to not like it when people pick out a single cause for dis for what's happening in the United States it's actually a bunch of things happening at the same time well the United States is a pretty resilient country the, the United States mm -hmm. you know dealt for example hundreds of bombings that took place in the 1960s you know people who were protesting against the Vietnam War um, and and we didn't call that civil war so what, like, like, why do you think that the, the United States will be unable to avert this impending disaster? Well, I think, you know, the thing about the 60s is, of course, you know, it was, there was certainly, there was certainly a lot of violence, you know, the 140 cities burned after MLK's assassination, and there was widespread political unrest. But, you know, I think compared to now, uh, you know, like the the um, the weathermen were at their peak about a thousand members, right? The Black Panthers were at their peak, but I mean, the numbers vary, but the, ten, the the high end of that number tends to be about ten thousand members. So the sovereign citizens have six hundred thousand members, right? And the the uh, oath keepers have, you know, the oath keeper list that were announced that was forty thousand people who are in senior positions of power. Right. Who are like like not, you know, not not rebels on the street putting, you know, blowing up post offices, post boxes. We're talking about people who are in police forces, who are in elected government officials, who are on school boards. Right. And so when you, what you have and also when you think of the 60s, there was you know, there was broad bipartisan support for civil rights. There was when when Kennedy was assassinated, even when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, there was there was a definite sense of the country mourning collectively and that this was a, a crime against the United States. You know, they, they could not get a collective group of people to give a moment of silence in the Senate for a man who died, the policeman who died during the January 6th riot. So, you know, you're, you're unable to come together to celebrate a man who literally died protecting your physical security. And your institutional security that's that's no longer possible and you know the the institutional breakdown of this moment is in stark contrast to the 60s you know even if you think of something like watergate which was you know supposedly this terrible moment for the united states um you know that was a sign of the the press discovered a crime um the the people believed the press when they said they discovered a crime and the political parties in power felt they had to respond to that crime so none of that would be true now right like none of none you could not make any of those statements with any confidence at this moment so you know what you have here is the decline of institutions that we that was not present in the 60s and then that of course makes the reaction to it much more toxic and and also it, it makes the reaction more larger much larger and how have things become so polarized in the last 50, 60 years? Like what's changed over these decades? Right. You get to the point where, you know, you cannot have, you know, bipartisan support in order to memorialize this person who has fallen trying to defend the Capitol. How, how, how does that happen? Yeah. And they also like there, there are a bunch of stats in the book where it's like, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't want their children to marry each other. Like they don't, Democrats don't want their children to marry Republicans and vice versa. They don't want, they don't eat together. There was an amazing study of, of, of Thanksgiving dinners where they did it with, um, where people went from different states, like blue states to red states or red states to blue states for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving dinner was an hour and a half shorter 
when they went when when you had like a by a cross partisan Thanksgiving. So they they literally can't even eat together um, anymore. Where the ex specific causes of it are, um, you know, that's that's hard to put your exact finger on. I mean, you know, uh, I I think the big one for most of the experts I sp spoke to was 2008, um, the housing crisis, as well as the election of Barack Obama, where you have a, you, you have both the death of the American dream of property, you have the, you have the, 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 the clear, the, it becoming very clear that generations are going to be poorer than the ones that came before them. You also have the decline of opportunity broadly. And then, of course, you have the end of white iconography of the presidency, and you have this multicultural iconography that comes to take precedence in Washington, and there's a reaction against that. So, to, you know, there are a lot of factors saying, how did it get this bad? But um, 2008, if, if I were to pick a date, it, it would be 2008. You, you, you've said, and you say in the book that there's a particular kind of tribalism that has emerged in the United States, mm -hmm. that, that these parties, Republicans and, and Democrats, they have become basically different countries, or, or rather, they live in different countries. They occupy a different kind of ideological, but also, yeah, ideological headspace. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think it's even, I mean, tr it is truly tribal. Like, you know, the there was an incredible study that showed that um, the hiring discrepancy rates, the, the, the prejudice against hiring outside of your party is now much, much higher than hiring outside of your race, which is extraordinary when you think about that fact in the United States, right? Like that that, that, that matters, that that kind of tension has now superseded you know, the, the, uh, the other, uh, the other, you know, the classical tension. Right. And, and yeah, so it is absolutely tribal. You see it in, I, I mean, it is really extraordinary when you go and talk to politicians about how, how hatred drives this industry, right? Like that's how, how you, you don't get elected in the United States by proposing ideas or even by being a good person, you, um, or having character, right. That people admire you, when in power, you, you come to power in the United States by creating fear and loathing for your opponent. And, you know, that part of that is, you know, the, the acceleration of their electoral system now where they are just so there's so much money and there's so much time spent on it that they can really that, that it, you know, that um, they've refined it to a point where they figured out what works and what works is hatred. But also, I, I think there is really a sense um, I mean, when you go to a Trump rally, you do see people saying, I'd rather, uh, you know, I'd rather be under Russia than under a Democrat. And they kind of mean it. Like, you have two very different countries emerging. Um, you have a multicultural democracy under Democrats, and you have a constitutional republic under Republicans. And these are these are actually quite different systems. And the countries, the, the places that they are from have very different values. And each one simply sees the parody of the other. And they have, they have incredibly little to talk about outside of, outside of, their, uh, outside of their hatred. Um, and, and certainly actual policy, like actual government policy, completely an afterthought, right? Like, you know, just, just not, barely even discussed. In pursuing this project, you had the opportunity to speak to a lot of different folks who constitute mm -hmm. the heart of the light. That's for sure. What, 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 yeah. what did you find? What did you find? Well, I mean, I found them very likable. Um, I enjoyed their company. Um, uh, we got along very well. They were all quite polite. I mean, the fact that I look like I do, um, certainly, it, 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 and I, I think the fact that I'm you know, for, I, I, I certainly have grown up around a lot of rural people, um, you know, that that didn't hurt either. Um, but, you know, like what 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 scared me about them, what really scared me about them is that they're quite educated. Right. Like you meet you meet people with law degrees and you ask them, like, OK, you're going to build this ethnic white state in the Northwest, how are, you know, how are you going to do it? And they're like, well, we're going to model our constitution on Japan's. And then they go through like a very abstruse legal reasoning. It's not, they don't have born to lose tattooed on their chest, so, you know, and like a swastika on their arm. Like they don't have any tattoos at all because they've been told like, we're going to put you in power. We're going to put you in the school board. We're going to put you on police review boards. Like, um, you know, the, and so that I found, 
that it, it, there's nothing quite as depressing as talking to a highly educated Nazi lawyer. That's not that's not a uh, that's not a fun conversation to have. Um, so, so what, you know, I, what, I mean, so what, yeah. What do, what do educated white people uh, talk about mm -hmm. when black folks come around? <laughs> What, what, what well, kind, they, what they of, certainly know. I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist, so I don't really get. I don't really get the truth, but um, you know, they certainly they like. I remember talking to Richard Spencer, who was like, you know, one of the leading organizers of Charlottesville, and he did graduate work at the University of Chicago. And I said to him at one point, I was like, he's a very educated man, and uh, I, I I said to him at one point, like. You know, you you went to the University of Chicago. Like, you must have, you, you must feel some kind of more connection with people who studied philosophy with you, who were people of color, rather than like these mobs that you're with now. And he was so offended by that idea. I mean, he really was quite horrified that I would say that he would have some kind of communion outside of his race. Um, they really, they really believe in racial identity as the totalizing sum of human experience. Right, like they believe that that is um, prior to every to every other form of identity that you can have, and but you know the other thing I should point out is this is actually quite a broad group of people. Like there's lots of different like there's some people who are just Second Amendment fundamentalists, and there are also tax evasion people who are you know basically scam artists who just don't want to pay taxes, and then you've got you know you've got all kinds of conspiracy theories. You got people who think that U.S. government has made you know, space treaties with lizard aliens and, you know, and QAnon and et cetera. So I wouldn't want to, like, it, it would just be inaccurate to kind of put them into one group of people. Um, but because they're, and, and some of them are just hobbyists, you know, they're, they're just people who like, they're just people who like, who, who, who plan for the end of the world. Like I go bird watching. Right. Like that's their that's their weekend plan. And it gives them a sense of community and they learn how to garden weeds because, you know, you can eat weeds, but the government won't take them away from you. And, you know, so it's a broad group of people. Um, and certainly in America, like what's upsetting is this is no longer a fringe group. Right. This is like a, this is like a, this is like perhaps as much as 30 percent of the country. So, you know, that's a that, uh, of 300 million, you know, 300 pl million plus people. So. You know, it, it definitely, um, definitely, a, a, there's a wide range of of views and a wide range of types that are that are in these communities. I think the term that you used in the book was you describe the hard right as being a buffet of sensibilities. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. I put that well. <laughs> like that's a yeah. there should be a check mark behind that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's and they go between them. You know, they go like, it's not like you, it's, it's like you can start off just being a, uh, a second f amendment fundamentalist. Like the, yeah, like I just believe in guns forever or a, you know, anti-woke activist, like something very mild. And then it, it molds. And then the other thing is like, when you get to the real right, the real hard right people, the Ottomoffen SS people, the white nationalist people, the Nazis, the. Uh, white identitarians, the European identitarians, they're all, they're all um, opposed to each other. Like they're all, like they're, they, they, they share with each other, but they're also quite fragmentary and they, they, like, they don't form into cohesive units. And the other thing that I found really fascinating about all of them in general is that they're, they're, the only knowledge that's worth anything to them is esoteric knowledge. So it's only a value knowing something if somebody's hiding it from you. And so everything has to be some kind of like, it has to be hidden. There has to be some kind of hidden meaning behind everything. This seems to me like, um, you know, something that is the only, like you, you because I was constantly looking for like continuous threads, like how do these people actually work? That was one of the very few. Because otherwise, like you, you find all you find all kinds of different forms of uh, of conspiracy theory and uh, wild political extremism. Like you find, like it, it's quite it's quite varied. And then others of them are sagebrush rebels who just don't think the federal government should be on land in the West. There are you know there there and then there are you know Moorish sovereigns who are black sovereign citizens who just hate the police. There are people who just then there are things like the Boogaloo Boys who, you know, if I'd written who the Boogaloo, Boogaloo Boys were when I wrote this book, it would be completely wrong, right? Because they were out 
they 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 just changed completely they changed completely every for three, four, five months, right? And you know, so writing about them is incredibly hard because um, because because they they fragment and they reform so quickly, and you, you don't really know where you are. Anything I wrote today, which would take me six months to research, would be wrong three months from now, if you know what I mean. And yet, and yet, you say you insist, like despite the the factions, despite the fragmentation, the the the, the fractures mm -hmm. that exist. In the, within the hard right, you you say that, or you warn against mistaken, yeah, making the mistake of seeing this kind of intellectual incoherence as a sign of weakness. Right. Can, you, can you kind of right. tell us what you mean when you say that? Well, you know, I think January six is a pretty good example of this, right? Where you know, if you're trying to find an ideological unity behind that you're like you're you're not you you could you know you could talk about that for a long time but you're not really going to find it um what you what unites them is well the the big banner of them is anti-government patriots so they believe that their resistance to government is itself patriotism right and this creates huge amounts of tension right like this is a like they 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 love um, they think that the, the way that to love america is to burn down its institutions. You know, for for Canadian, of course, this is virtually inconceivable, right? Like for us, our country is its institutions in many ways, but for them, it it really isn't. Um, and so that, like, and they are, you know, they are certainly unafraid of violence, and they are heavily armed. I mean, you know, I certainly talk to people who had tanks, right? I mean, like, there's, like, there's, there's, and they found many people with low-grade nuclear, uh, you know, materials, uh, you know, that, to make dirty bombs and so on. So, like, they are, they are very elitely armed. I mean, not that it would make a difference against the U.S. Army, but, uh, or the U.S. military, rather. Like, it, but, you know, they are, they are definitely a force to be reckoned with. But, I mean, we all know that. We can, we can see that with January 6th, right? We've seen it, and, and that's just the beginning. So, so they're committed to the to the kind of dismantling of government and, and, and these kind of governmental institutions. And now they have representation in Congress. Well, that's it, right? I mean, this is where you get these incredible contradictions that are tearing America apart. I mean, the one that really strikes with me is Mike Nierman. Well, I mean, you have Josh, uh, uh, the senator Josh from, uh, yeah, raising his fist as he's entering the Senate. You know, a son of a banker, right? Like that, like like an elite, you know, Stanford educated, like, and he's like raising his fist to this mob. But Mike Nierman in Oregon, I mean, he opened the door for protesters who came in and vandalized the, the Oregon legislature. So he opened a door for them, and then he walked around and came back inside the building. I mean, not not maybe the smartest move in the world. Like you're inciting violence and then bringing your on yourself. Right. And yeah, th I mean, this is the this is the contradiction that is really at the heart of this problem. And it, it's it's unclear how it can ever be resolved, because, you know, like when you go and hear these people talk, they'll they'll say things like um, you're all slaves. It's like, OK, well, what do you mean by that? And then they'll be like, well, if if you don't pay your property taxes, the government will come and take away your property. And I'm like, well, OK, so the existence of property tax then is is enslavement. I mean, what society in the world then is not enslaved, right? I mean, if you take paying property taxes as a form of social death, how are we ever going to get into a society where where that is where that is not what that where where there isn't that where there isn't that reality? So you know, it is unmoored from reality. I mean, that's the that's the long and the short of it. So, so what's their end game? Like what 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 kind Oh, there's of, no end game. What kind, of world, what kind of world, what kind of America or the United States of America are they imagining? I think honestly, they're not imagine they're imagining some f combination of the Wild West and the end of Star Wars. Like they're they, they, like they just don't want like their their conception of themselves as patriots, anti-government patriots. Um this is not this is not something with a big plan. Now, there are people with plans, 
like there are people who like want a white ethno state in Oregon. There are there are separatists and secessionists who want Texas to be its own state, but they're kind of a, I, I consider them separate from anti-government patriots. There are certainly Democrats too in California who want a separate California for uh, for the left, right? So I, I think of them as a different group, but the, the people, the, the, the the anarchic, rageful energy, political energy that's in the at the core of the hard right, um, with the Marjorie Taylor Greens and so on, it 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 just has no coherence whatsoever, right? Like there's no, it, it, it's not, it's not a, uh, it, it's not. That's why I think when people call them fascists, it's actually a big mistake, because like they're like the fascists had a very conscious plan of how to use the state to enact to create certain realities. They don't have anything like that. Right. Like they're just they're purely reactive. They just want to burn things down. You, you say that, you know, you're painting quite a quite a grim picture. And, and yet you, you were saying mm. that you don't think that, they, that this kind of right wing movement, this hard right movement poses an existential threat to the United States. Or it doesn't pose a threat to the government, really. Why do you why do you say that? Well, I mean, I think it's, it, it poses some, you know, January 6th was a very, very horrible day for the United States. What I mean by, like, they genuinely think that they can go up against the U.S. military, and um, they can't. Like, no one really can, but th those guys really can't. I mean, you know, if you like the Marines are the Marines for a reason, like professional soldiers are professional soldiers. And, you know, even though there are a lot of flip Marines, there are a lot of uh, army veterans in in the far right movements, um, you know, like having access to Apache helicopter. I mean, you know, I talked to several uh, military experts uh, and, and I was, and I wanted to create a battle scene, right? Like my idea was I'd have a battle scene between these far right people in the U S military. And they were like, well, there really wouldn't be a battle. And I was like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, we can turn off the water whenever we want. And we have, you know, tube guided, you know, Apache helicopter missiles. And we have trained cadres. Like we have like the, the, the idea that they're going to actually, be able to control any territory in the United States is frankly laughable. Now, that doesn't mean that they they couldn't, you know, end the United States because, you know, the Taliban were also not organized and the US went in and they won every battle, you know, every major battle in Afghanistan and they still left. Um, you can't, you know, the, the counterinsurgency is not, uh, you know, the only solution, the only way to win counterinsurgency is not to play. Right. Um, as Putin is finding out once, you know, as uh, again, we seem to have to learn uh, the great powers need to learn this lesson over and over again. But you, you cannot really win against an insurgency um, that, you know, that but that so that's that's really the problem. They, they could not they could not in, in combat. They would have no chance. Like, I could not find anyone who would give them any chance whatsoever against, you know, the U.S. military. But that doesn't mean that they could not make you know, cause political unity to fracture to the point where essentially uh, the United States become became truly ungovernable. So what would what would the next or what will the next civil war look like? How, how will it kind of manifest itself in real terms? Right. Well, I think, you know, the it certainly won't look like the first civil war. Right. Like it won't be, as you said, 600,000 dead and, you know, 3 percent of the country and like 25 percent of men in South Carolina died um, and this, this huge destruction um, and this and, and these pitched battles like that's not what it'll be like. It'll be like Iraq or the, the worst case scenario would be Syria, um, where you have political violence as the norm. You have the fracturing of movements into ever tinier fragments and in and, and the widespread use of political violence as a means of legitimacy, legitimacy and control. Um, you know, that's the, the, the technical definition of a civil war starts at a thousand combatants in a year, a thousand combatant deaths a year. So they're already at about 75, which is over the threshold of civil conflict. So they're they're already technically in a state of civil conflict. Um, it's really more about the normal the normalization of political violence and the rise of 
you know, uh, insurgencies, uh, which when you look at someone like Kyle Rittenhouse, like it's not like they don't really understand it, but that's what an insurgent looks like. Right. Like that's what that's what an insurgent looks like in South Africa. That's what a insurgent looks like in India, everywhere. It's like a young man who wants to defend the community's property. That's like that's one side of the story. Right. But like that's that's what an insurgent looks like. Um, and so, yeah, like political it, to me, what what the, the, the future that I imagine and that the experts led me to imagine was not political blocks or even political negotiation, but a struggle between order and chaos with chaos growing. I, I'm wondering, though, if it's frankly irresponsible for you to be engaging in what some might consider to be this loose talk around civ civil war, like the prospect of civil right. war, like engaging in this kind of apocalyptic um, conversation kind of feeds the beast, does it not? I mean, I don't think that's what the guy in the Atlantic said, right? That's what the reviewer in the Atlantic said that I was being irresponsible. Fintone I mean, tool. I just Fintone don't. Tool. Yeah, fit no tool. I mean, I just don't have that much power. Like, I mean, I like I'm not shaping the discourse in the United States even remotely, right? I mean, what I what I feel that I've done in this. You're trying to affect the well, discourse. What, I, what, you're what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do in the in my own small way, I mean, a book is just a book, right? Like it's not, it, it, it does not have the power of persuasion of a film or, or, or something like that. Uh, like a, a book, what I'm trying to do in this book is identify the trends and also say like, you've got to wake up, right? Like the, 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 there, there is a point here of no return for the United States and it's not that far away. Um, and you know, they, like what, what we need to know as Canadians, cause we're extremely vulnerable to all this. Um, but also they need to know is like, you know, by 2040, 50% of the country will con control 85% of the Senate, right? Like that's, that's a, that's coming, right? So I don't think there's anything wrong with being ready for that reality because that, that has nothing to do with anything that I write or anything anyone writes that's, that's happening. Right. And that, that, that's, I don't know that's, why that's, it would make any difference to be like, to be like, oh, what a surprise. Suddenly the Senate is an illegitimate body. Like, I was, you, you, we I should know. Say, that's, the, Senate, the Senate is fundamentally anti-democratic in terms of its, in, in terms the of the way in which it's Well, the Senate it. is, the, the thing is, it's not really the problem that it's anti-democratic because, you know, what, what is, what constitutes democracy? Like some people could say like, well, when Stephen Harper was prime minister, he only won 39% of the vote. And I mean, it's certainly less for, for Trudeau. Maybe that's anti-democratic, but that's not really, the problem is when things seem illegitimate. I mean, democracy exists to make tra the transition of power feel legitimate to people. That's going like, and if, frankly, it's almost gone. Like only 20% of Americans think their electoral system is fair. I, I mean, the electoral college is, in short order, like, I don't know if it's going to be 2024 or 2028 or 2032, but it is going to return a president who loses the popular vote by 10 million votes, by, by a hugely significant number of votes and still, and still holds office. And whether Americans feel they're living in a democracy or not at that point is really hard to know. So, you know, none of that stuff has anything to do with little old me, right? Like that's like, that has to do with you know, with trends that anyone can, can see. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm, the, the trends I'm describing here are also, most of them, a lot of them are really external to action. Like they're not, like it's not anything, that, there's not anything that anyone can do. Like, I, I don't have a solution to the U.S. Senate other than don't do it anymore. <laughs> like, you know, have a constitutional convention and figure out a better way of, of rule, of governing yourself. So, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I, I think it's incredibly flattering to me to suggest that um, I'm sending America on a path of destruction, but you know, it's on its, it, it's got, it's, it's on that path on its own, just fine, doesn't need, this isn't going to make any difference. And the, and the concern is that, that none of these institutions that, that, that for a long time kind of held the country together these institutions no longer have legitimacy or, or, or in the eyes of, of large swaths of the population. Yeah. And then the, and then what comes with that, because, you know, that's the, the classic formulation here from the, the scholars on, on civil war is that in autocracies, civil war is very rare. 
in democracies, civil war is also very rare. It's in the gray area between them, anocracy, that that's when the violence starts. So in addition to only 20% of Americans feeling that their system is legitimate, you know, 33% of Americans recently said that they would be willing to use violence to achieve their political goals, right? So that's when things get extremely, extremely dangerous for everyone involved, right? Because political violence builds on itself. State mechanisms of repression to control violence tend to just lead to more violence. So it, you, the, the police and the army are in an impossible position where the attempt to control violence actually leads to its spiking. Um, that's when you. That's when things start to get out of control. And and these systems are, you know, Congress's approval rating is at nine percent, right? The Supreme Court no longer. It used to have very high uh, approval ratings. It doesn't anymore because it's just partisan hacks now. It's just it's just one it's just one one partisan hack, another partisan hack, and they're in conflict. That's it. Who has more partisan hacks? That's the only question of the Supreme Court now, right? So that's those those are the conditions of breakdown, and they're you know you know they're right there. Everything has become. I think you state this. Everything has become a zero sum game in America. Yes. In America, no. Well, it's not, it's it's. it's it's literally causing the other person to lose is the priority of, of everyone in politics um, to the point where national interests, like they flirt with reneging on their debt. Like to, to the, the, that, the level of national irresponsibility on that, that's playing Russian roulette with your entire economy just to score some very, very negligible political points on your opponent. But also I think there's something that's happened at the same time, which is that like literally everything has become political, right? Like you go to the grocery store and you can buy LGBTQ positive cookies and you can buy homophobic fried chicken, right? Like there's like, there's like chicken sandwiches, you know, like there's like every single element of life has become political and charged with this deep tribalism um, that, that at the same time as point scoring becomes this, this endless game, this endless stupid game right where and, and national interest becomes really quite quite lost like it becomes quite lost in the in the in the discussion you know i i was curious as as to whether you feel that there's a possibility of of, of changing the conditions that are leading to the breakdown of the country right. the, the, the change the conditions that are leading to the disuniting of the United States and whether, you know, this book of yours, is it a declaration or is it a warning? It's a warning for sure. And I mean, the other thing is it's written out of love. Like it's not written, like this is a book written out of love for America. I mean, like it, it's not written out of contempt. It's not written. It's certainly not written out of snobbery. Like I'm not like a European snob who thinks I'm better than these guys. Like I, I, I'm under no impression that we're better than them. I know we're not. Right. Um, but these systems are in breakdown and I think it needs to be pretty, like, I, I think, you know, among my liberal friends in the United States, they're, they've been taught from the time they're children that their that their country is the solution to history. And that its institutions are the model of the world, and it's it's the shining light on a hill, right? And it's like no, like you're you're actually in real danger here, like this, like these these systems are breaking down. There are real consequences to that. It's not just like, oh, things are going to be ugly in Washington for a while. There, civil war is one of the is one of the worst things that can happen to a country. I mean, I I think genuinely it's probably worse than being conquered, right? And, and so it's like it, it is it is very much a warning. Um, as for like hope, I mean, you know, it's funny because this sounds like such a lame answer, but um, I, I really think that the thing about Americans is that they, they have reinvented their country. They reinvent themselves. They reinvent their country all the time. And they do it there. If anyone's capable of reinvention, it's them. Right. I, I would also say that what's not going to happen is that it's just going to bumble along. Like it's not going to be like the 60s where, you know, there's all this violence and so on. And then suddenly it's all quaaludes and disco and lava lamps like that. That 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 that's not going to happen. Like the, 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 the things are only going to get worse before they get better. And, and they do really need a, a a look at their political system. Right. As, as a whole, like not just as a not just as a who's going to be in power. Like it needs to be like there's the constitution is now 
and an antique. I mean, it's a very brilliant document. Don't get me wrong, but it's an antiquity. It's it's just too old, right? I thought I thought you were going to say that Americans need an intervention. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean, if only we could, right? I mean, like, like there, there, like there's, there is something like it is like watching your big brother, who did, who, who lives in a massive house, um, go on a meth binge, right? Like there is definitely some part of it that's like it's like watching, it's like watching someone you've admired your whole life fall apart. Um, yeah, they definitely need an intervention. If who would be, who would do it though? I mean, I guess oh, us. What, 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 are, what are you? Canadian, you're like you, you've you've lived in the United States. You you lived in New York City yeah. for a number of years. You went to school there. Yeah. You taught there. What are you able to see in the country that maybe Americans? You you, you reference your liberal friends in in, yeah. in the states. What are you able to see that they're not able to see? Somewhat akin maybe to Alexis de Tocqueville, who in the 1830s maybe was able to see things in the United States that a lot of Americans who were inside, you know, the belly of the beast weren't able to see. Well, I mean, I think you have to leave your home to be able and come back inside to smell what's rotten in it, right? Like, I mean, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, that's true of any country. That's not that's not just true of America. But, you know, I mean, I think Canadians have a very, you know, we, we're pressed up against the glass of the United States. We live there. You know, I have my Trump voting cousin in Seattle, right? Like, I have all my friends there. I've worked there for most of my life. Like, I'm certainly familiar with America. On the other hand, I'm not an American. I, like, you know, America is not my mother. Canada is my mother. And, um, and, and, and like the, what they take for granted as the normal way of life is very apparent to me that it's not the normal way of life, right? I mean, when you go to Oklahoma City and there are signs outside the schoolyard explaining which guns you can bring into the schoolyard and which ones you can't, I'm like, you know, that's not normal. Like that's like they're like they're that's not that's not the way that everyone in the world does it. Like, um, you know, and I think America is America centric, right? Like they are the empire, and they they think that their way of life is the only, kind of the only way of life. And uh, you know, you have to be from outside to sort of see what. I mean, I think that's why there have been a lot of Canadians who've made a living commenting on America, like Gladwell and. Um, you know, et cetera. Like there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, just a little an enough distance to see them without, without, without rancor either. Like without, without contempt, like just like we're this, we're sort of the same, but we're just different enough. You know, Northrop Fry said that a Canadian is an American who rejects the revolution. And I've always thought of myself as just exactly that. Like I'm an American who rejects the revolution. There's, there's one point in your book where I think you, you went to this kind of gun expo, this gun fair. Mm -hmm. I believe it was, I think it was in Tulsa, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And I think it, yeah. I think you said it's five, like just, just, just to kind of give people a sense of the scale of this thing and, and the number of guns and types of guns that were in this space. I think you said it took you five long minutes to walk the length of the field. That's how many guns there were in that space. Can you talk about just you know, I was, what... I told you. Well, I was reporting on on the I was reporting on it for the Guardian, so I was like, okay, I better I have to walk the whole thing. I mean, I'm here as a journalist. I like at least have to pass by everything that's there just to know what it's saying. That took me six hours, like just to walk up and down. I mean, it was in the cattle market in Tulsa. It, the only room I've been in that large was the was the fish market in Tokyo before they closed it, where you can like slightly see the curvature of the earth, like from inside the building absolutely enormous absolutely vast they had every gun i've never you know it was one of those things where like you enter a realm of human um achievement where you're like they've really taken this to the end right like they it, like they've really taken this they've they've taken this to the ex to the extreme like it's like you can you can manufacture your own how to manufacture your own ammunition that's like 20 booths that's like that's like twenty different guys teaching you how to manufacture your own ammunition. Plus, you know, like the Beretta, you know, fifty calibers, historical guns, you know, guns on sale for two hundred thousand dollars, revolutionary period guns, tiny little guns, tiny little pistols, twenty twos for your daughter in pink, um, you know, like 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 every kind of gun that you can imagine. People people selling them. Like people would walk around with flags on their back with a list of guns, and then they just give the gun and 
just take money without paperwork. It was just, it was astonishing. And you know, it's not like Canada's like that gun, 50% of Canadian homes have guns, right? Like all of my uncles own guns because they all are on farms or they all are in, you know, on acreages or whatever. And, uh, but it's not the same, the, the aesthetic reaction to weaponry in this place was just, I've never seen anything like it. And it went on, it went on forever and ever and ever. I mean, the first day I just walked it, the second day I interviewed people, but like it, it just took, it just took forever. It just took forever to just walk through the booths. It, it was and extraordinary. And there really is a kind of a gun frenzy afoot in the United States as we speak. Yeah. In the last couple of years, the number of guns that have been purchased, I think it's broken all the records. And I think you, you also point to the fact that the the, the communities that are, are the growth areas in terms of gun ownership, it, it's, it's the African-American, the black community, and it's women. Yeah. What does that tell us? In 2020, well, I think that tells us that, you know, there's always been a fantasy of like resistance to the federal government among rural. Uh, those are the people at these gun shows. They're not hunters. They're not, you know, it's like, it's like, like you're not buying an AR-15 to go and shoot pigeons off the thing, or you're not, you're not buying an AR-15 to shoot a deer, right? Like you're doing this out of a fantasy of resistance to federal authority. And, um, or, you know, because you can't even, it's not even home defense, right? Like if somebody comes into your house, you don't reach for your AR-15, right? But um, yeah, those are the two largest groups. Now, there's been a lot of theories of why that would be. It might just be simple saturation of the white market. But, um, but, it, but like, it, it, it's also, I think that there's a, there's fear growing in these communities of, you know, of who is going to protect them in the case of, you know, mass political violence, and they're going to have to protect themselves. So, yeah, I mean, those are the two largest, those are the two largest growth areas. They're still not, they're not the largest purchasers by any means. But, you know, there are 400 million guns in America, right? Like, I tried to get a, I tried to get an account of how many rounds of ammunition there are in the United States. I mean, no one has any real idea. Like one, like the, the, the high estimate was a trillion rounds. Right. Like no one, no one, something like something around 12 billion rounds are sold every year, but they really don't, they really don't know. So you, you have like virtually uncountable guns and then, and that's not even counting ghost guns, which are, you know, increasingly on the rise and which they can't, they can't do anything to stop. And, and then ammunition, which I think, you know, if you were to put it in a statistical category would be uncountable, you know, like they just, they, they just simply, there's just so much of it. They, they can't count it. Um, I asked you that question a couple minutes ago, but whether your book is a warning or a declaration for a reason, we, we were having a, a, a conversation, we were mm -hmm. chatting before on air, and I was mentioning to you that I think this year marks the 40th anniversary of this seminal documentary, a really important documentary for this country, uh, certainly for the National yeah. Film Board, If You Love This Planet, was, 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 uh, was released in 1982, it won an Academy Award in the short documentary section. Uh, Terry Nash was the director, and it featured, of course, the Australian physician and anti-nuclear activist, Dr. Helen Caldicott. And the premise of the, 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 the documentary was really centered on a talk that she gave um, at, uh, I think it's SUNY Plattsburgh, University of New York at Plattsburgh, where she's talking about the danger posed by the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And of course, you know, this it was released at the height of the Cold War, the height of the, the nuclear arms race. Uh, the next mm -hmm. year, the following year, 1983, um, the day after uh, was released. Right. Uh, about the effects of nuclear Armageddon, like the day after nuclear war. And I was telling you, like, I think I was, what, 11 or 12 when I, when I saw those, those films. And they scared, like they terrified. It was terrifying to yeah. watch those films. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you were saying that you have a relationship with, with particularly oh, this with is, the day after. Tell us about that. This is a ripoff of the day after. Like basically what I did, I say it in the, in the opening chapter. I'm like, look, this is modeled on the day after, right? Which was originally a piece of fiction written for U.S. Congress, basically taking the science of what a nuclear attack would look like and putting it in a fictional form that would make it meaningful to people. And that's what I've tried to do here, right? I've tried to take the best available information on American political decline and American political danger. And, and you know, like things like the model on what happens when a hurricane hits New York is incredibly specific. I mean, they know to the street 
what will happen when a hurricane one, two, three, four, five hits New York. So I just took that and put it in a fictional form and then showed the workings of it. That's what the day after is. And you know, the day that that's what I aspire to, right? Because the day after was the, the most popular television show of all time. I think it still holds that for television movies. I think, I, I think it, as I recall, it had some obscene number, like 180 million, 180 million. viewers or something. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, some cat yeah. vast numbers, like, like, like mash finale numbers. Right. And, um, and Reagan saw it and he said in his diaries, I saw the day after we have to do something about this. And then that was the beginning of the Inter intercontinental ballistic missile treaty. So it, you know, that the, the day after literally changed history, right? It literally caused a reevaluation of, um, of nuclear war by the most senior levels of government. So, you know, that, that's, that's what I, I'm trying, my hope would be to be that for political chaos in the United States. I mean, that's a big ambition, but certainly the day after, I, I must have seen it 50 times, but, but while I was writing this book. But, but Stephen, I don't see, I, I don't see a lot of possibility in your book. I, I don't, I don't see, I, I don't see a lot right. of, and I, I don't know where. Do you um, see a lot of possibility how, in reality? How, um, I see possibility in people. Yeah, that's where my hope. Well, is. Yes. My, my hope is my hope, sure. my hope. my hope is in my hope is in people who are able to, um, yeah, affect history and change history. So I always, I but always the, have the, hope in, in people, and I, and I think it's, I think it's always important for us to talk about possibility and talk about the possibility for for transformation. And I'm wondering if you see possibility for transformation. But I think it's exactly like you say, the possibility is in people, but it's not in the systems, right? Like this is a book about the breakdown of systems. This is not an indictment of the American people. It isn't. Like, like the, the, the American people are no better and no worse than, in fact, personally, I think they're better, but like the, 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 the then, then, you know, even then Canadians, but their systems are in collapse. And, and that's the subject of the book. And it, the question is, how do you escape from that collapse? Because the, that collapse has happened to other countries. And, you know, I, I think Americans do have a thing where they think they're exceptional. They think they are the exception to history. They're not. You know, no one is, ex no, no one is exempted, exempted from history. And, you know, th th this book is about that. So, you know, I, I don't really, I don't want, I, I think the time of false hopes is over, right? Like the time now that has come is the time to look the situation in the face as flatly and as barely as we can and to see how we can in that, you know, what would meaningful change be? Because, you know, like we, 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 I, I think we, the, the messages of hope that I hear are not like the problem here is not in people. It's not in people's hearts. It's not in there. It's not. It's not in the American soul. That that's as as, as it has always been a com, a combination of light and darkness. The problem here is that they're they're going to reach a point where they're no longer living in a democracy. If if they don't make drastic changes to their political system by 2040, they will not be living in a democracy. They will be living you, you in say, something that you know that really does not deserve that name. You you say they yeah. will not be living in it democracy but but it would seem to me that this is not just a domestic issue that this or rather this is a domestic mm -hmm. issue with global consequences and and, and so i'm Absolutely. curious as to what, what are the consequences of this next civil war in the united states for canada for the rest of the world what what would it mean if such a if such a cataclysmic event were to take place what would be the the impact on the rest of us well for us for canadians it's just a straight disaster Right. I mean, we're tied to this country. We, we can't really escape. I mean, we can make noises about trading with China or trading with Europe. But I mean, let's just be realistic here. Like our 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 global international trade is with the United States and um, a, a disaster there is just straight up a disaster for us. And not only that, it endangers things that we've never thought about. Like we, we've never thought about in the entire history of our country for 200 years, questions of even questions of national sovereignty. I mean, I don't want to be too fear mongering here, but, you know, a dictatorship to the South would be a direct threat to us. Right. Like that would not that would not be that would not be something that we could 
you know, just put out of our minds, right? Like that, that, that and, and we saw, we already saw that with Trump where we were declared a national security threat. And, you know, I don't think we're going to forget that for a long time. Um, there's no question that if America leaves the path of Western democracies, um, the, the other Western democracies are going to be, you know, Japan, Korea, Europe, and so on, are going to be a lot weaker. And of course, we're in a world where the autocracies are growing, right? Where the, the autocracies in Russia are growing, where the autocracy in China is growing, where they are gaining strength, where it's unclear what path India is going to go. Like it's unclear, it's unclear where, where they stand on pluralism and democracy. Um, and, and so, Yes, absolutely. It, it has massive global implications for us, for Canada. I mean, we would just be a, a victim like we, we the, the, but for for the for the future of democracy in the in the world as, as a whole, this is absolutely the most pressing issue. I mean, I, I would say even more than the autocracies themselves, which, you know, ultimately, you know, if we are strong and democracies are strong, we have always won against the autocracies. So you know, the, the, as the, the epigram to the book is from Lincoln, and it's like, you know, if, if we're going to survive as a republic, we're going to live, if the threat isn't from outside, the threat is from inside, right? Like the threat, like if we're going to die, it's gonna, we're going to either die by suicide or live for all time. That's what Lincoln said. And I, I think he was absolutely right. Would, would American politicians do well to, 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 to read George Washington's farewell address from time to time? Oh my God, I was so shocked when I read that book because I read it after I'd written most of the book and he just knew exactly what was happening in his country. I mean, it was, it's, it's shocking. How, well, I mean, what he, you know, he was, this, he wrote this um, with Hamilton, like Hamilton co-wrote parts of it um, after Alexander he, Hamilton. after, after Alexander Hamilton, after he, with Alexander Hamilton, after he, decided to go back to Mount Vernon. So he gave up the presidency and, and became a farmer again, which was at the time considered one of the greatest acts of history, right? Like he could have been the dictator of America forever. Um, but he said, no, we're going to be a democracy. I'm going to give up power. You know, you're, we're going to we're And George III said that makes him the greatest man in history, that, that act. So that, so he gave this speech at that moment. Right. At this moment where he has pure moral authority, like a, a, a true like he is, he, he, he's never going to be bigger than this moment. And at that moment, he says, the real worry here is that partisan division by and geographical division will rip the country apart. And, you know, I think what he what he understood about the threat of partisanship and, you know, that speech was memorized by school children right up until the Second World War. It was it was it's still read in Congress once a year by a different each year, a different party member reads it. Um, but his it, you know, it doesn't have it used to be on the same level as the Declaration of Independence and the prologue to the Constitution. So it, it, it has lost that favor, but it's equal to those documents for sure. Um, you know, I think what he understood is that America as the, the system of government where they essentially wanted division. You know, they wanted, the, the system of government is built on nobody being right and you're not coming to consensus, like actually always built debating things. You, you say it's a Built on difference. Built. Yeah, a pluribus odum, right? Like out of many, one. And like, and they, and they and that, and the original system was so brilliantly constructed around that that respect for difference, right? For in itself, not as a goal to something else, but just in itself, difference. And America is by far the most heterogeneous country in the world, right? I mean, like it is so. It's much more diverse than we are. It's much more diverse in ideas. It's much more diverse economically, racially, politically, every other way. Um, but you know, he understood that the danger of that is that it would fracture. And that, it, and that, and that you would you would fail to keep the unity, or you would emphasize the difference to the point of losing the unity. And if you, and then if you're not on the same side, you're you're not on the same side anymore. And that's basically what's happened, right? I think in some ways what we're seeing now is the end of the American experiment. In that that faith in difference, that 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 simple belief in respect for difference is evaporating. 
And, and, and that's a much harder, like the, the things in this book that I'm describing are systematic failures. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're failures in systems, they're failures in, uh, to prepare for climate change, they're failures. Of the, but at the core, there's something that's happened in the American people where they've, they've lost that faith in, in, in respect for difference. And it's, it's very hard to know how to get that back. You, you say that you wrote this book not out of contempt or disdain. Uh, you wrote mm-hmm. this book out of love. You, you, you say that you love the, you love the United States. You, you, you've spent yes. much of your career there. You studied there. You, you, you've, you've taught at university there. Um, yeah. What was it like for you to write this book? What was it like for you it to was, embark I on mean, this it project? was... <sighs> well... I mean, it was very hard. Like, I well, I, sh- I, I hate it when writers complain because you know it's such a it's such a luxurious lifestyle anyway. But you know, it, like there were certainly many nights where I could not sleep, and there were also many many times where I was confronting people that really frightened me, and which I we, and which I felt a great deal of fear about. Um, but you know, like I started writing it right after I attended the 2016 inauguration for Trump, where. It really was like it was it was it felt like the fall of Rome. You know, I'm standing on top of a limousine. Suddenly the limousine's lit on fire. I'm walking with anarchists and then I go for cigarettes because I'm freaking out. And the anarchists are all arrested and they're charged with felonies. And like it, it, you know, it, it did feel like I need after that, I was like, I need to describe what is happening here. Right. And I need to understand what's happening here. I need to know what is going on. And so this book was very much the process of trying to see the madness as absolutely clearly as possible. Like the only, the only thing I wanted in, in the book was clarity, right? Like that was, that was the only goal I just needed. And that's why I didn't put in things that I felt, I thought were debatable or disputable. I only put in things that I was like, I am sure of this. I know, I, I, I feel quite confident in this, in this idea. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was a torturous process indeed. I mean, you know, totally fascinating. I mean, I, I, I think the thing about America is that it's so interesting, right? Like it, it just never, it never ceases to have that kind of fascinating, surprising element to it. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, it's definitely hard. It's like seeing your big brother going to meth binge, as I said, it's like, it, there's something very ugly about it. You said, if I can, like, if I can kind of push you a little bit more, who scared you? Yeah. You, you mentioned that people who really scared you, who? Well, you know, Nazi lawyers are very scary. Like they're like, because they're not, you know, I, I think when you meet like violent, you know, oath keepers who are putting together colloidal sis, silver and in, in their bug out bags and they're like, they're, they're, they're not really threatening. But when you meet people who are, you know, not racist in the sense of like prejudice, but like actively believe in white supremacism and like actively believe in it as a political ideology that they, and then, and then have arguments and then have legal arguments. You know, that's a, that's a very frightening thing. I mean, the other guy who scared me was the guy who told me about corn in the Midwest and what, what it's going to be like when corn does not grow as readily on the great plains. And that, I mean, that was the one where I couldn't sleep for like multiple nights after that because it was just because of climate change. Because of climate change. Yeah, and because they're using the Algalala aquifer and they can't really, and it's not even climate change so much as like they can't adapt. There's an adaptation trap, which means that they, they don't know what to adapt to. And, you know, American farmers are very brilliant and extremely innovative. That's why crop yields are nine times, nine times per acre what they were in the 1930s. But there's a limit to that. And we live in a universe of cheap food. And I mean, that's starting to change a little bit with inflation, but like, when a world without cheap food, when the world without cheap, when, when the world doesn't have cheap food, I mean, all of this is in, in peril, right? And, and a hu- like, you know, the Midwest produces 40% of the world's tradable commodity crops, right? So it, like, it, it, it's, it, it's a big, big deal. And very, very you know, I, would, I would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about this, because we, we've talked about race, we have talked about the, mm-hmm. the, the part in the United States, we haven't talked much about class. We haven't talked as much about about mm. inequality. And 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 you yeah. say in the book, in, in a very kind of um, robust fashion, you you say that that no uh, 
empire or no country that has the the the, the, the amount of inequality uh, that the United States has has survived as a political entity. How 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 yeah. dangerous is, is the, the the levels of inequality in the United States to its future? I I mean. Like, again, this is a complex cascading system, so it's hard to separate out which ones are uh, more dangerous than others because they all feed into each other. But, you know, America has very high levels of both horizontal inequality and vertical inequality. So that like vertical inequality is the one we, we talk about, which is like and that's never been higher, like literally since 1776. There has never been as much inequality in America from the very top and the very bottom. Um, but horizontal equality is like equality between different groups, different identifiable groups, which is also incredibly high in the United States. Um, yeah, like the, the, that is also that is a problem without a solution because no one the, the the ways that massive inequality tends to end are revolution, um, which doesn't even spread wealth it just simply destroys wealth um war which just simply destroys wealth and you know a, a cat cataclysmic events like earthquakes and so on the only way to remove those that structure from things is simple destruction which is horrible which is like a, you know one of the most well, there are other, um there are other ways there are, there are, like if there's if there, there, there are other ways there are other ways that 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 is that is that can't, there is a solution to that if there's the political will to to to, to change, you know the, the way in which. Uh, but even even high levels of taxation, yeah, even that, even that the really does, no, but it doesn't. Like even very very high levels of of taxation don't actually end inequality, right? Like that's the thing. Like they don't. What like what happened in the 1950s and 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 a certain extent, which was that inequality diminished on its own. That had nothing to do with taxation levels. I mean, it, it had something to do in England with that. But really, I mean, that's why you have people like Thomas Piketty, like his solution is massive grants to every single person at 21 to give every single person capital. But he would argue, I mean, his study, which is where I take all of this ideology and capital and, um, uh, and the, the previous book, uh, he doesn't think that any of those things end, uh, end inequality. They just simply stunt its effects, right? They stunt, they, 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 they um, but it, it doesn't actually stop inequality. It just, it just makes people feel that it's fairer. Um, very, very, very hard to know what to do with that. Um, you know, like, I mean, obviously so, there's inequality and then there's societies where you have nothing. And, you know, the thing about the United States is that, like, we have very high levels of inequality in Canada, but we also have health care and we're about to get $10 a day daycare. And we have we have basic functions of life that are that, that are for everyone and which I think we can take great pride in. And, you know, Europe has the same thing in America. There are armies of the dispossessed. There are truly people who have nothing. Right. They don't have health care. They, they don't they don't they don't have anything. And that's a very different reality than than inequality in other places. It just is. Are you ready for your next project, Stephen? Are you already working on your next? Yeah, project? something quiet, something something like light. I'm gonna have to do like a children's book or something. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I'm going to have to do like, you know, <laughs> Fairyland. Uh, maybe I'll do like Harry Potter, but with fairies or something like that. Yeah. You know, something yeah. a little, little more relaxed, like like le like less less uh, less talking to Nazis, less talking to educated Nazis for sure. Stephen, it's been a delight <laughs> speaking with you. Thanks so much for this. Yes, you too. Adrian. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you very you. much for having me. Stephen Marsh is the author of the next Civil War: Dispatches from the American Future. It is certainly worth. Uh, purchasing and, and buy several copies as well share them share them with your friends uh, so thank you so much for for spending uh, the last hour i guess in 10 minutes with us uh, and thank you of course as always to the good folks at the ottawa uh, writers festival for all the work that you do thank you to mike for all of the technical uh, support that you offered uh, tonight and uh, again please do support the ottawa International Writers Festival. It is an institution that is uh, an integral part of cultural uh, of the cultural life of the city of Ottawa, and so we hope that you will continue to uh, lend support to it. Thanks so much, and have a good night.